That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Trade Talk. I'm Super 2 and this week we're going over Batman No Man's Land Volume 2. Now we're continuing this series and getting further and further. So, this is where a lot of the late 90s, early 2000s art starts to really kind of rear its ugly head. And so some of this is just, just ugly to look at. There's no real way around it. And then, but other times it works. Uh, it's, it's that weird in between. Uh, a lot of the designs are really cool though. And you do get really great moments. Like, this starts to do a lot of stuff with Two-Face. And this is a cool ass Two-Face panel. Um, so I did like that, but I don't know, you start flipping through and there are other things, which is like, oh, that is not pretty to look at at all. Uh, I'm trying to find a good example of it, but nothing's popping up right away. So maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe there's stuff in here that's, that's better than I'm giving it credit for. And then maybe there's stuff that's just like stands out as really, really ugly. Um... I don't know. I don't want to dwell too hard on things that I don't like, you know? But anyway, so this continues the, the situation, and, and this volume in particular gets really into the rogues and rogues gallery and what they're up to, and the, the gang warfare dynamic in particular. Um, particularly advances the power shifting power dynamic and and changing allegiances going on between Harvey Dent, the Penguin, Jim Gordon, and Batman. Uh, Jim Gordon, of course, it's revealed, has allied with Harvey Dent in this volume. And on that note, I gotta go to the cover gallery because this is possibly the worst cover to have used for this volume because you had Brian Boland here and you should have used the Brian Bullen cover that totally covers ha, 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 a lot of the, the meat of the story that's presented throughout these issues. This Brian Bullen cover is incredible, and it's totally what they should have used. Um, God, I love this one. That's so perfect for a lot of the themes going on in this issue, or in this volume. Uh, but anyway, so... Harvey has tricked Batman, and Batman has lost territory. Meanwhile, Gordon and Harvey have gained territory because of this trick uh, at the cost of Batman and the Penguin. Um, but there's obviously a shaky alliance between Harvey and Gordon, and so that's kind of what's at, it, what's at fault here and what we're all wondering about. Ooh, good two-page spread. As someone tries to read Bruce Wayne's mind. It's kind of cool. Uh, but, you know, there's it's just an interesting dynamic as as Gordon kind of deals with the, um, the fallout of everything. This also is where we get the reveal of who the new Batgirl is, which is uh, Huntress. Because Batman puts her in charge of the, defending their territory and she loses it to Two-Face. So, like, this is a great... Uh, end, ending page for a chapter as Batman returns to his territory and says, Tales you lose. Like, I love the, the graffiti up at the top crossed over the Batman symbol. Uh, I love the way that this is exactly how Two-Face would take territory from Batman. Um, anyway. We get the origin for the new Batgirl, Cassandra Cain, uh, who is not taught a language who's only taught in combat and that is a really weird idea but it totally works and it's she is the best batgirl forever and always she is the best batgirl i love cassandra kane as batgirl so much um it's just the most unique and interesting idea i think i've gotten or i've seen anyone do for for batgirl i loved her so much and when we got to see her but they ruined it. Uh, they ruined it, and they gave us Stephanie Brown, and I'll never understand why. So anyway, uh, Batman tells Huntress, since she failed him, that she can no longer be Batgirl and makes her give it up. And 
yeah, becomes, you know, and get, decides that he's been wrong about trying to defend No Man's Land on his own and brings his allies in. So Dick and Robin and the rest of the Bat family are here. Uh, and Cassandra Kane becomes the new Batgirl because of it, which is cool. I like it. It's it's a neat way to introduce the Bat family proper, I think. Uh, it's the same Batgirl costume, which I think is probably a little disappointing. They maybe should have done something to uh, create more of a apparent difference between Cassandra Kane's Batgirl costume and Huntress's Batgirl costume because it's kind of like Batman just just stole Huntress's and gave it to Cassandra Kane, which is I don't know a little weird. Um, I'm trying to find a good oh there we go. She's definitely drawn differently, I feel, uh, compared to the way Huntress was drawn, so that helps, but still. Um. Anyway, it's just neat to see Super or Two Face get more to do. He's a he is a character who unfortunately just does not have a ton of stories. Two Face and the Riddler do not have a ton of stuff. Like obviously you got Long Halloween, but comparatively you don't see as much uh, with Two Face done. Nick Sharp is also taken out by Azrael here, and I talked about what trying to scratch my head and remember if the Azrael stuff was even in the old volumes. Uh, I was told it was, and that is how memorable it is, because Nick Sharp gets taken out, and he's he's no longer a problem. Yay. Um, there's some stuff with uh, Kirk Langstrom's wife, whose name always escapes me. Um, God damn it. Hmm. I can never remember her goddamn name. Anyway. So Kirk Langstrom's wife gets a story where she's got a son who's like a little bat boy. Um, meh. It's whatever. Then there's these this effort. Um, there's this guy who apparently locked himself in a studio and has power. A uh, television studio and has electricity. Let me put it that way. So he's been broadcasting a show every night and Batman and Oracle hijacked the airwaves in order to broadcast his show to the entire United States to try to, um, help reestablish, uh, sympathy for Gotham, which is kind of cool. Get a sense of the way rules have changed with Two-Face again. That was kind of cool. And then we'll get a Nightwing story where he gets, um, he's given a mission to retake control of Blackgate, uh, away from lockup. And so Nightwing has to work with the villains inside Blackgate in order to take over uh, from lockup. Though it's kind of funny, and this happens when you get these bigger collections. Uh, there's a Catwoman story later on that has the exact same problem, and it's just ridiculous to read. Uh, there's like this whole thing with this guy. I have no idea who he is. It's like a conversation about him getting a pig heart. And then there's this whole thing on this other page about some guy confessing to being Nightwing, but his is spelled N-I-T-E-W-I-N-G. Um, and I have no... Th that is not concluded at all within this volume, and I do not expect it to be. That's just, yeah, here's what was going on in the Nightwing book, and this is why he's in Gotham now, but we're going to continue this plot thread. Okay, whatever. That's just crossovers for you. <laughs> Um, so Nightwing takes control from Black, uh, from Lockup, which is kind of cool. This, this is a great example of really ugly art. That's just, ugh, to look at. Everything about that is weird. Barbara's face looks so strange. The, the way they've drawn the bridge of her nose up to her eyes is like a mile long, and her eyes are just, it's, it's not good. It's, it's, it's bad. Uh, then the other story arc that I really, really liked was called Fruit of the Earth, uh, which is a Clayface and Poison Ivy story. 
and this is interesting because we've been given maps of what Gotham City looks like uh, as far as the gang territory and whatnot um, throughout the volume. And the middle section there in green is Robinson Park, and it's got Ivy. It's assumed that Ivy's in control of it, but no one really knows because everyone that goes in never comes out. Um so this goes, this does a little backtracking, goes all the way back to day 23 of No Man's Land and has Clayface go into the park looking for Ivy. And he finds her growing food and taking care of the orphans of Gotham City there and proposes a plan to her for them to be able to get rich together by, you know, growing produce and, and selling it because... There's no fresh produce in the city. Again, I really like the way that they're using, you know, these these very particular realistic issues because, yeah, it's a city. You can't necessarily grow food there, especially in winter. Um, so it's just, of course, people would be willing to pay or trade more for fresh produce. Um, so anyway, he proposed this plan to her and then... We don't know necessarily how it goes, but we know Ivy tries to kiss him, um, like, you know, do her whole poison kiss thing, but Clayface says, nice try, and so the story develops, uh, and Batman gets interested in what's going on with the park, um, and we're just, we're seeing some evolution. Let me figure something out real quick. Uh, Fruit of the Earth. This written by Greg Rucka. Okay. Because it's interesting, because we also develop the uh, the Officer Pettit storyline here, too, where this guy who stayed in No Man's Land because he kind of wanted to just kill crooks and, and stuff like that. He's, like, you know, that power-hungry kind of cop. So I was giving Bob Gale some shit, and, and maybe he still deserves it um, for that, that line about, you know, the weak and unmotivated and former welfare recipients uh, in the first volume. But this, that story also set up the idea that Gordon's going pretty far, but there are guys who are, want to go farther th for malice alone. And so this is kind of extending on that, where this Pettit guy is clearly just out for blood, and Gordon's trying to actually maintain order and, and decency. So, though this is written by Greg Rucka, so I don't know the the behind the scenes drama if uh gail always planned to have that happen or if rucka was like oh set up my character here and i'll do this story later or whatever um anyway batman gets into robinson park and finds ivy plastered up in clay with a bunch of children enslaved and she needs help uh so this fruit of the earth story i really like because it gives you this sense of Ivy as that kind of middle ground ambiguous character. And it, it mentions that she serves the green in here. So there's your whole swamp thing connection and everything. But no, this, this gives you that, like, she isn't evil because she's taking care of these kids that people just abandon um, out of the goodness of her heart. She's not getting anything for it. And she has been used her her stuff is used against her often but she's still really brutal because she works with batman in order to get out of this situation um but at the end of the day once she's got power over clayface uh she really just demolishes his ass uh man i got, i love this lines Um, from me to you with all of my love, can you feel that, honey? As, like, she starts growing things inside of Clayface, uh, and just enveloping him. Your good soil, full of nutrients, full of minerals, the roots like you. You're creating life, you're feeding all those plants growing inside you right now. They're going to use you up. Just like you tried to do to me. Like you tried to do to the children. I offered you a kiss when you first came to my park. And you hit me instead. 
I've had enough of what you will or won't allow, Batman. So it's really interesting. She just is absolutely merciless to Clayface in what she does to him. And, and this is really, really great sequence there. But it's definitely much more in the realms of justif justified. You know, she, um, she straight, like, was held and the dude was doing child slave labor. Uh, Clayface, like, please, begging, please, please, do you still want to kiss lover? Don't m m make me... I seem to remember begging the same thing of you. And she kisses him, and, and he just kind of turns into a plant. Uh, she completely, you know, destroys Clayface. Um, and then, so Batman makes a deal with her, though, to provide produce for the people of Gotham, but no more than the land can take. That's interesting. You know, I, I quite like the, the direction that goes in and everything that that deals with. Um, it's, uh, it's just good. Uh, I really quite enjoyed that, that story. It, it, it gives you a, a better insight into Poison Ivy's head. Um, and also on the Two-Face front, you start to get the, um, the sense that he is a bad partner to work with because Gordon tries to cut their alliance via Montoya and Harvey kidnaps and apparently injures Montoya. So we don't quite know where that's going to go. This also, like, starts to address further the um, rocky relationship between Batman and Gordon that existed because Batman didn't come to No Man's Land for, like, the first 90 days or whatever. Um, and we get a whole scene with with him and uh, Gordon, where he tries to tries to talk to him, tries to repair the damage, and it blows up in his face because as he tries to talk and reason with him, uh, Gordon just punches him in the face. So Batman decides to leave, and he's like, Two Face isn't an ally you can trust." And Gordon's response is, "Neither apparently were you." So there's a rockiness in this bromance right now. Um, and yet Batman being Batman is of course proven right because what happens when Two-Face loses half of his gang, um, and tries to cut ties with two, uh, what, not Two-Face, when Gordon loses half of his gang to Pettit and tries to cut ties with Two-Face, oh, well, Two-Face plans to, you know, uh, force Gordon to stick with him. It was just, you know, an interesting little dynamic it worked well uh the the wheels are turning machinations are moving and then there's a whole story with catwoman uh the reason batman went into robinson park was to try to receive retrieve some computer discs um and that somehow hold the future of gotham i don't know what those the, the we never get an explanation for exactly what's on them um but ivy destroyed the computer discs she found in robinson park um, because they're plastic, they're bad for the earth. And so Batman needs Catwoman now, who has not been in Gotham. Catwoman has been in New York City. And, man, this story's weird. Uh, like I mentioned, um, I mentioned that, like, crossovers tend to be weird, where they gotta kind of shoehorn in the crossoverness and, and still stay true to their their current story. Uh, so let me just read from some Catwoman's internal monologue there. I was all set to steal my way back into the Gotham when I heard about this little lovely back in Manhattan. It was begging me to take it. And the rest of my little sojourn in the Big Apple didn't go quite as, w as I would have liked. I took over a big business and ran for mayor. I wound up with my assets frozen or confiscated and forced to assassinate myself. I didn't make any of that up. I, I want to read that sentence again. I took over a big business and ran for mayor. I wound up with my assets frozen or confiscated and forced to assassinate myself. Comic books are weird, man. Um, 
So anyway, she steals this cat gem, but then it melts and it turns out it was just bait to uh, get give her orders from Oracle um, to get to Gotham City in 12 hours or she, it'd be assumed that she couldn't make it. And that immediately pisses Catwoman off and she knows that Bruce Wayne, is, uh, that Batman is fucking with her and, and like in, intentionally pushing her buttons because he's given her a challenge and assuming that she can't get there and, and he took uh, a toy away from her. So, you know, she knows he's in her head and, and that's pissing her off. So she, of course, goes to Gotham. She gets to Gotham and he gives her a job of stealing some um, computer disks from a vault in Manhattan that is, of course, under the protection of Bruce Wayne. And why does Catwoman do this? Well, instead of kicking Bruce Batman's ass, well, because he kissed her. So this is a weird story. Uh, I will say though, as as weird as like the contrivances and the contrivances are out of the fucking park here. As weird as a lot of the contrivances are, including, you know, a guy who has a superpower but doesn't know it and his superpower is not to be affected by kinetic energy like explosions. Um, I do like the tone of this Catwoman series because it's all about Catwoman pulling off heists and crimes. Like, the first issue is all about her process of sneaking into Gotham and you know, having the military chase a piece of bait while she slips under the radar. And then the second issue is all about her performing a heist. And I really like this, where she goes into where the, um, where the discs are being kept to talk with the security guards, and she tell like, she's posing as someone from Wayne Enterprises, but, um, they've never heard of her and blah, 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 blah. And she's like, Oh, well, good job. You you saw right through that, that little test of mine, and I wouldn't have expected anything less. Though there is one other thing. We've received reliable information that the criminal known as Catwoman intends to steal the discs. What information? Reliable information. What's your source? Need to know only, Mr. Mosquito. And you don't need to know. Ciao. And then the security guard's like, Well, she's got Moxie, I'll say that for her. Who? Catwoman. That was her. Straight up odd. So, like, that's a really cool Catwoman, like, heisty thing to do. And then, like, the, the heist goes down, and there's, like, explosions, and yada, 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 and Catwoman, um, pops up and takes out one of the guards, and it's like, oh, if you're wondering how I got into the building with all the chaos outside, I never left. I just stayed in the elevator when I came. And she steals the disc, but it's a double fake because the discs weren't actually where they were supposed to be. But then it's a triple fake because the discs were moved to another location and she doubled back and stole those discs and replaced them with the, the copy. And then she's uh, got to find out, like, she, she wants to plan to, you know, give Batman a middle finger and sell the disc, discs off. Um, and Maxi Zeus gets involved and it's a, it's a whole thing and a half, but it just, it feels, you know, very like, you know, heist movie kind of thing. I like the show White Collar and it feels just like the, those same caper, caper is the word. It feels like a caper story. So that's cool. Um, it kind of ends on a cliffhanger and the implication is, gonna, is that she's going to go back to Gotham with the discs, but we don't get any more of that story arc here we just get another single issue called power play that's really not good uh it's about mr freeze and what he's up to and i hate to say but the best thing about it is the really cool cover it's a really great mr freeze cover i'll give it that um for a while when i first started buying comics i would just buy things for the cover and i do have this one really kick-ass mr freeze cover and it it this is another one that I'd want just for the cover, but uh, just that issue is really bad because just it feels like a seven-year-old wrote, wrote it. There's just constant banter between Batman and Mr. Freeze, and Mr. Freeze is not the bantering type, in my opinion, and neither is Batman, particularly this kind of really, really typical comic book ba banter. Um, ice is a transient form. It melts. 
The water evaporates and then condenses. So what are you saying, Freeze? That you're a big drip? I was making an allusion to the impertinence of change. Things are going to change, all right. How so? Remember what I said about being five moves ahead? Well, just... That's way too much talking for this fight. It is so unnecessary. Uh, Batman blows up Freeze's castle that he's using to control the, um, the only working power plant in Gotham, which is a cool follow-up to the Visitor uh, issue in the first volume where Superman restored a power plant for Gotham City, but it immediately fell into the wrong hands, and there's really no way to, to reason it out to people because of the, the culture had changed so quickly in Gotham. Um, and people had become so tribal. Uh, so, you know, there's it's a neat idea of a, of a follow-up. Batman, like, taking some of that power away from Freeze. I'm not quite sure why. We're not given much of a reason beyond Freeze is now killing people, and maybe that's reason enough. Um, but, I don't know, it was just... It was a really poorly written issue, uh, specifically on the dialogue front. So, what are you going to do? I do like that Freeze has a giant ice castle though that's cool oh, i gotta see if i can find a good panel of it um but yeah he just made himself a giant ice castle to guard this uh this power plant and eh, there's a panel of it cracking so you know coolness uh overall still loving the series uh still a lot of cool twists and turns um and you know i i read is probably red leader until he's one of the few people um keeping up with each volume that i talk about and he's like oh i like the first volume the most but once the bat family and all the other uh batman rogues get involved it just starts to fall apart for me and i'm like no see that's the thing that i always really liked it's just you jump in with both feet uh this was again the first big crossover i read and it was so cool to get to see all the different bat family members and all the different villains in this huge interconnected story um I just really like seeing how they they are really in control of Gotham and the odds have never quite been like this for Batman. And he's losing here, you know? It's it is his whole I'm alone or I don't want help or I, I don't want to endanger others thing is what costs him the most in this story, uh, because he, he allies with someone who he normally wouldn't, and that bites him because he didn't ally with his normal folks. So I don't know, I really like that. I really like seeing all the different dynamics with the villains. Again, the Poison Ivy, Clayface story, Fruit of the Earth, I think is a really, really good Poison Ivy story. Um, you know, she... It's maybe a little problematic in that she is weak and in distress and stuff, and Batman has to kind of come to her rescue, but at the same time, once she is safe, she's not all, oh, Batman, thank you. She is, like, pissed. And it, it really works. It, it It's really cool to see kind of her take and and so she is that grayer middle area where she's not just expressly evil she's doing objectively good things you know caring for orphans right um but she's her methods are the part where you're like so that may be a little much <laughs> um so i don't know plenty of good in this one though i uh i really got a kick out of it um excited to read volume three um that'll do it for this week's episode of Trade Talk, though. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. Until next time, bye. That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book.